Hi, well I'm Debbie Bent and uh, this is Made with Clay Studio at for Santa Hall in Letchworth. Um, so my introduction to Letchworth was in coming to see um, a new studio that, that Digswell Arts Trust had just acquired. I had already applied to Digswell Arts the year before um, and not got through. So George Woodcraft asked me to apply again and I joined as a fellow, just as Fenner's building was being renovated. Dixwell Arts didn't want to do um, ceramics community classes anymore, so a lot of the students were asking me, is there another space we can go to? And um, I didn't know at all. I drove around Letchworth looking for small little sheds and buildings to see whether or not there was anything and I, I couldn't really see anything so I got in contact with the Heritage Foundation and it was them who suggested for Santa Hall which I'd never seen before and um, I came to have a look at it. So it had been left, it had, the roof had been leaking and, we, and it had been fixed but the space did have a pottery feel to it. It had lovely thick walls. Um, it had two rooms, one that you could house the kiln in, one that people can work in. Um, but everything was broken. So um, there was a broken toilet, the kitchen was broken. The, um, when you switched the water on, the taps spurted water everywhere around the kitchen, had woodworm, smelt of mould, and there'd been animals living in it. So it was, it was very smelly, it was very derelict, and it was very um, unloved and uncared about, but it had the structure that we thought would be perfect. For Santa Hall is, um, I think it was built in 1914, and um, it was built by the Theosophical Society, and they also, the architect also designed cloisters, um, and there was an extension added another time, but we can't quite get the date of it. So it's listed, has a big plaque saying, there's no religion higher than true. And it's also got another listed um, brick outside that says that when the first sod was cut outside. Um, so the Theosophical Society had it for 100 years. And then at the end of that, the lease was ended and it had to, and it reverted to the Heritage Foundation. We've been to look at the building. Um, and then been given the price of the rent and been told it was available. And then I was asked to apply to the Heritage Foundation for the funding to turn the hall into a ceramic studio, which was quite a lot, about £12,000. So I sent in my business plan and I was told that that wasn't quite good enough. But they were really good. They supplied a business advisor and um, to write a business plan with me. And I also got two other directors on board, so a financial director and a fundraising director. Um, and between us all, we wrote all the policies, we did all the financial forecasts, um, and wrote all the plans up. And then we had to do a, a big PowerPoint and meeting with the Heritage Foundation Grants Committee. Um, and they said they'd let us know. And it was a yes. <laughs> I 
we had moved out of um, the Fenners building and I took all anything that was mine home um, and I had then lockdown came and I was at home with all the equipment and tools um, but I had also lost some of my other work at Oaklands College and at Courtyard Arts so I was just at home on furlough um, so I set up in my garden um, a mini ceramic studio under tarpaulin and I acquired all the, I bought all the glaze materials that we needed, all the buckets and all the labelling and I got on all the preparation for everything. I'd been saving for a car so I had some savings um, and I used that to buy all the glaze materials, all the things that we might need and to write up all the processes for when we moved in, all the labels and it was really nice to do because it was very quiet um, I had nothing else to do, so every day I just got up like a day at work and went out into the garden. I had my kiln at home, so I was able to fire everything and make sure that all the glazes were ready for when we moved in. Time was invaluable, actually. We finally got the keys. I'd been in and out of the building measuring up and working out where everything was going to go and we finally got the keys in September and we wanted to open as soon as possible and get some money in because obviously we didn't have much money to keep us going through a winter without any money coming in but we were still in lockdown so we came in and I had to draw up a detailed plan. We were allowed six people, two were the builders, and then I had two in each room. So there were two rooms, two other rooms, and the toilet area, and we just did a rotation. So every night I put on the group chat, tomorrow I need this, tomorrow, um, and the next day I'll need this, and at the weekend we hope to be doing this, and different people put their names down to do different parts of the project. And then I coordinated when they were coming in and when they were going. And then at the end of each of that, I had to clean everything down, all the tools, all the, um, all the handles, everything, toilets, wash them all down, ready for the next people coming in the next day. And it worked really well. Um, had all sorts of people coming in, people from who I'd known at Fenners, people... Um, people that I was at school, my kids were at school with when they were in primary school, all the students, their friends, their families, my kids, lots of different people. But it actually was done really remarkably quickly in about six weeks. So um, the builders were here every day. Um, we had, yeah, we had Bobby in every day. Um, and we had the electrician come in but the rest of it was all done by students, people we knew. Part of the business plan was that we had to prove that along with the Heritage Foundation giving us the grant, we also were funding it ourselves and we had to match a lot of it up. So in terms of time was one resource, but also um, a lot of the tools and equipment came from either myself or from other ceramic artists that I know so there was a, there's a wheel out there from um, Pat Joyce and there's a wheel out there from Jill Patrick um, Zara's family built the tables March brought um, all the shelving um, Susie bought the slab roller so in the end we had um, nearly everything we needed from either my savings which were the glazes and materials and slips and all the equipment was all done by people coming in and people were offering things all the time. When we came in September, it was just starting to get cold. We had some old gas heaters in here, but they were really old and they had black soot marks up the wall. And although they were tested and shown to be safe, most of the students didn't feel comfortable about them being on. So we had plug-in oil radiators, but we could tell that because the building is listed, 
and therefore it can't have any insulation. It was going to be a really cold building and we were worried about that in the winter. We were also washing everything down in cold water. So the water was getting colder and colder. Everybody was sort of, we had one water heater just for washing up. It wasn't enough. Um, and we found out about the Civic Trust. Um, so um, ended up putting a very quick grant application in, um, found a gas engineer on Facebook um, who came and gave us a quote, got the grant in, and that was granted within about four days. So when we closed for Christmas, we were able to get proper heating put in, which actually changed everything because the walls had been damp and we, they weren't drying out. So when the heating went in, everything changed. When the work had finished, and it literally was the day before, and we still didn't have in, any sinks in either. Um, they'd been delayed with Brexit and um, COVID. So we were opening without any sinks. We did have two in the toilets, but we didn't want to put clay down those. So I was really, we careered into the day of opening. Um, I was quite tired and I realized quite soon that um, I've been excited about it opening, but it wasn't going to be a place I was coming to play, that this was now my job. And I did have a sinking feeling for a few minutes the first day that, oh, actually, I'm going to work there, not play there. And, um, and it is a, quite a lot of work running a place like this. But when I got here and I saw everybody all excited, big smiles, and I realised they didn't care that they had to empty their buckets out on the grass and that they would wait for the sinks and they were all wrapped up, they knew it was going to be a bit cold and they, they just wanted to be here, then it all changed and I, I felt really quite excited about the space and it already had a, a lovely warm feeling from all the people that have been working in there. Yeah, I think we had another couple of lockdowns um, after it opened. And the first one was quite soon, I think. And everybody said, don't worry, um, we'll continue to pay. We'll come and take clay home. You can leave it outside and we'll drop work back to be fired. And so again, it was quite a positive time the first time. Um, we got on with the next load of jobs, which was reorganising the space for how it actually worked, um, labelling things up, firing people's work, leaving it outside. And um, the, first look, the first part of lockdown was actually, you know, a catching up period again. It was, you know, we had the heating put in, so it was all good. But the second lockdown, I think people had, was a different mood entirely and we had quite a lot of people who just didn't get in contact, who dropped out, who, um, who didn't feel that, that that's not what they signed up for. They signed up for a social, um, exciting space where they sparred off each other to doing it at home and it wasn't the same. So um, we survived it because we got some funding. We got some COVID funding, but we wouldn't have been able to survive without it. Um, now the space is running and um, we have Zara who's been our technician for the last year, um, apprentice technician but she does that now fine um, and now she's training to be a teacher so she's got her own little class on Mondays and I work with her and she's, she's teaching. We also have a new tutor started this term, um, Jill, she's doing Tuesday nights and we have a couple of volunteers. We have Alice who does all the admissions. So the first inquiry all goes through Alice and she coordinates making sure that they've got the welcome letter and the medical forms. And then we have um, Exchanges Esther and she is uh, a student also um, who coordinates people swapping to different classes. So if they can't make one class, 
they write to Esther and Esther tries to arrange them to come another day. Um, but we also have, when we want to do the garden, everybody gets together to do the garden. We do a garden barbecue. Um, we've got Martin who is sourcing some trees for the garden. We're trying to get heritage trees. And so he's been sourcing some fruit trees. Um, the boy next door mows the lawn. We do pay him, but it, we still try and have it so that it's quite a local community resource. And um, and just small things. People bring things in. Um, so we've got a texture box. People bring things in for that. They bring in bubble wrap. They bring in newspaper. So And they support each other in other ways. If someone's off, someone checks in on them. If someone can't come because they're isolating, they go and bring some clay to them and collect their work. So. so we have, we, we call everybody members um, because although they attend, normally they have a specific class that they sign up for. They can also, if they miss that class, they can also come to a different day. Um, so that's what exchanges that Esther does. She makes sure that we don't go over the numbers, but she coordinates that. So, um, so that someone with shift patterns or a poorly child or, um, or any reason really can come on a different day. So they pay, their, they pay their money each month. And for that, they get their three hours each week to be in the studio and normally there's no charge for what they make or how much they make but if they started to make a lot of throne work there might be an additional charge but mostly we haven't had to use that at all actually. Um, when we first started um, it took a while for people to get like comfortable in the space and also to get comfortable with the people in their group. Um, but as soon as that started happening, we really noticed um, people starting being much more creative, more independent, the, pro the work coming out of the kiln was much more exciting. Um, people were bouncing ideas off each other, supporting one another, helping one another. And there was a lot of crossover of ideas, um, a lot of talking that goes on. Sometimes it's actually really, really quiet. Um, and people are working, but often they'll be discussing the best way to do things or how they would do it. Um, we've got a little library here as well, so they'll be looking at that and seeing where they go. And we've really noticed a massive, um, not just technically getting better, but much more creative, much more interesting. Each month we see it getting better and get really excited opening the kiln, see what's happening there. So both myself and Zara um, make our own work. So we understand that it's important that you have the best of what you can afford. So everything that's in the studio is stuff that we would use ourselves. We don't have a cheaper version for the students. So we try and provide everything that they might need if we can. So we have wheels, we have the kilns, but we have really top quality stains in the slips and underglazes, um, the best glazes that we can afford. Um, we make some ourselves and we use and we try to get the best ones we can. Um, we've got really sturdy tables, we've got the slab roller, the extruder that Pat again gave us. Um, everybody gets their own shelf so that they can keep all their work in their own space and it doesn't get jumbled up um, and they also can keep work they're making there and their um, tools and things here so that when they walk in it's a nice peaceful environment we make them coffee um, a couple of months ago they all wanted to have really nice coffee so we looked at the budget and we brought cafetiers and proper tea and whatever so we try to make it a space where they feel really nurtured Hmm, that's one of the nicest things, actually. Um, one of the nicest things about being here is that we get constant feedback that it, the students call it their happy space, the place where they go to relax. 
Um, some students talk about the place they need to come to if they've got if they're caring for someone elderly, or they've got children, or they've got really busy work. They come in here and switch off and get on with doing something creative. Um, and that's why it is really important that we try and have everything easy for them, because we understand that for a lot of students, this is the only time they get when they can when they're not in charge of things and when they're not having to do something for someone else. It's good to take stock every now and then and have a think about the future of where we're going. Um, and that's why we're a community interest company, so that it can be passed on to the next level of people. Um, to carry on for however long it needs to. Um, but our plans at the moment, um, firstly to continue to try and get some more people in because we can keep the prices down as low as possible the more students that we have. But also there's an optimal number of students, so we've worked it out at 66. Um, before it starts feeling crowded, we need more shelving, we need more um, shelves for work, we need more days that people can come in and we don't want it to become that sort of space that becomes frantic. So um, instead of keep getting more and more students, we're hoping to do sm smaller um, short-term workshops. So working with maybe Jackie's drop-in again that we did at Fenners, working with other community groups, small blocks of working with families, open days, taster days, um, but small blocks of workshops where people come for a certain amount of time um, and then go, we've got some interest with schools. So again, they might come after school, they might come for a block of a term, um, but the, the, um, the running of everything, really, to keep prices as they are, would need, we'd need about 60 students weekly. Um, and, then we, and then everything else is on top of that. Uh, so one of the things that, um, a couple of things that we like to do here as well as the normal firings are the Raku firing, which all the students found really exciting and we did that uh, recently. Um, but we also are going to do a smoke firing on the shortest day of the year, on the 21st of December. The, the students, when they come in on the 21st, they'll get their work um, and they will wrap string or wire or um, banana skins or coffee um, around the work and then they will bury it in sawdust, wrap it in a piece of newspaper and we will place that um, newspaper and sawdust in a smoke firing bin which is just like a normal garden incinerator actually, put them all together in there, set fire to them. And what that does is the carbon creates the pattern on the work. Um, but we also do a kind of ritual when we do that, and that's why we've chosen the shortest day of the year, the 21st, is because we normally, in placing the work in, we say goodbye to something that's been bothering us or something we've been holding on to that's negative, we want to let go of. Um, we say thank you for something in the present. Um, it's not normally out loud, people say it in their heads, although some people do say it out loud. And then we make a wish for something in the future. And then the work goes in. And then when it's collected, um, take it out of the sawdust, wash it under the tap, put some beeswax polish on it. And that's a reminder then of those promises to yourself of letting go of something and hoping for something in the future. And it's about the only spiritual thing we do. <laughs> One of the things that um, people ask me about um, how did I get in here? And um, the answer often is that um, it's just step by step. I've always been interested in art. Um, 
the clay started when I did an access course at Ware College and one of the modules was clay and I think from there I realised that that's how I could express my ideas and I continued working with clay after that. I didn't expect anything like this because I grew up um, on a London council estate to a single mum and as soon as I was 16 I left home, I left education and I had to support myself and so although the Harrow School of Art where they have a really good ceramics program was just up the road from me I didn't even hear about it um, no one talked to me about that at school because um, it just wasn't on the agenda and um, a couple of my friends did go to university but for me I didn't even think about it. I knew immediately that I'd have to earn a living. Art was always part of my, part of my being. And um, I spent a lot of time at Kew Gardens when I was a kid. <laughs> Get the bus there on my own. Um, museums, libraries. So I was always that kind of person. But art seemed like something that people from other backgrounds did. I did an access course, which was absolutely brilliant because I was earning uh, part-time and looking after my children. And my husband was happy for me to go and do uni as long as um, all that was done. So I progressed from access to HNC and HNC again because I wasn't ready to go to uni then. My children were too, still, still too small. And I ended up going to university in my 30s. And the fees were quite low then. And that enabled me to work part-time and pay them. And it was the best experience in the world. I'd go back there and do that any time. And from that, my first gallery show from my degree show. And I also got offered a job in art straight away after that, teaching ceramics. And then from there I got my other jobs teaching ceramics and from there I got other jobs teaching ceramics and from there I got the confidence to apply to Digswell Arch Trust um, and get a studio and that changed everything for me, it gave me the confidence being with other artists. At first I thought, well, I felt a bit mispla out of place. Um, I thought they were all fantastic artists and I didn't know how I'd snuck in. Over time, growing closer to them and being more comfortable, which is how I recognise it here, I realised that I was in the right place and um, my confidence really grew from that. So I think it's always been part of my nature and it's always been me, but I don't think I would have ever dreamed that I could have ended up here. That's the truth. <laughs> it makes me feel tearful actually saying that. Don't know why. <laughs> I think it's just, you know, when you're a little girl and you do all your drawings and everything and everyone's always telling you, oh, um, you know, yes, 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 but there's no money in that. Yes, 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 that's very good, but there's no money in that. And they really steer you out of doing art, don't they? So you, you know, yeah, you have to really stick to your guns to be an artist, don't you? Despite everybody saying, what the hell are you doing that for?